Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this edition of the podcast, I have the pleasure of speaking with custom knife maker, Jared Oser. In the age of the titanium frame lock folder, Jared has made a name for himself lending his modern design spin, materials, and techniques to the classic slip joint folder. And you all know that I've been in a slip joint phase recently. Uh, he makes patterns that are once familiar uh, in the bones, but absolutely unique to him. I've been admiring his traditionally styled knives, but with uh, unorthodox blade shapes and same but different frames uh, for a few years now. And one thing I really love is how the designs straddle the generations of knife making. Uh, his work is so compelling to me that I bought my dad a Benchmade Tengu flipper uh, for Father's Day last year. It's an Oser design, obviously, and it's quickly become his favorite EDC. And who knows, you know, by the end of this conversation, I might be well on my way to my first Oser knife, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. You know that slip joints have been on my mind lately, so I'm very excited to get into this conversation with Jared Oser. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Jared, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. Hey, Bob. I'm happy to be here. Man, well, uh, you you heard that setup, so now you know kind of my frame of mind. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I've been I've been prowling the the slip joint pages for for a long time. I come in and out of different phases of knife collecting, and uh, on this last pass, uh, I was not only looking at GECs and and the the things I like to look at uh, the real traditional things, but uh, well, Birdvis knives caught my eye about a year ago, yeah. and and then after uh, talking to Nick, I discovered you, or or I think I knew of you before Nick. I think I just spoke with him, okay. yeah. And uh, and then I saw the Tengu flipper, and I was like, my God, it's as if that knife were designed for my father, who's got a love of the katana just in general. Yeah, but he carries around slip joints, and uh, and you know gentlemanly he's a gentleman you know so, yeah yeah exactly so for father's day last year i got him that and nice. it's it's in his pocket every day in the little slip he loves it and uh I, I think it's pretty amazing too so uh, i was reading on your web page that you started as a knife collector and then at some point felt compelled to start making knives yes tell, tell me how that uh how that sparked you must be an artist i am an artist i actually have been an artist, like a drawing with pencil, painting, sculpting type of artist since I was a little tiny kid. Uh, I studied graphic design in college, in fact, and I had a, a career lined up with a, a graphic design department and a computer a computer company here in Utah right after getting married. And then things changed. I ended up being of all randomness, a builder for about 20 years. But I did collect knives. I, I've collected knives my whole life. You know, same thing. I saw my grandpa with a pocket knife, and that always stuck in my memory. And uh, then I got on a kick where I wanted to have the best quote unquote survival knife. And so it started there. I started collecting knives. Then I got into bushcraft more, which is more the realistic end of survival, I guess. Um, and a lot of my passion sparked from Andy Roy over at Fiddleback. Uh, he oh, yeah. was doing some different things with bushcraft knife, knives that I really liked. Um, and so he was kind of an inspiration to think about that. And and his style I cued off of, and I actually started doing bushcraft knives myself. I built the knife and the sheath, and it took me a little bit less than a year after starting to Decided I wanted to go into slip joints because that's what I really loved. I wanted to do that, but it seemed very hard at the time. But it just kind of uh, evolved from there, and uh, taking the modern sign that I liked and 
the old school style that made me feel good and went from there. Interesting. The old school style that made me feel good. That's kind of my uh, uh, attachment to the slip joints too. I'm a sentimental guy. I, I, yeah. I joke I'm a sentimental Italian, but that's true. I am. And, and there are things like that, that, that makes sense to me that you would go into something like that um, because it makes you feel good because it resonates yeah. with your past. Um, but as a young man, uh, you must, and you, you, you had the, you had the survival knife thing in you. I'm curious, like, how does, how does a young maker right now choose slip joints over, over the seductive pull of the titanium frame lock? Uh, you no, know, it's, uh, I think that it, it, it I, I, just being an artist, color and design and that mixture and blend of colors was important to me. Uh, it's something that Andy did very well in mixing colors, and I try and do that as well. And it, it just kind of evolved naturally. People were initially not very happy with what I was doing. Really? You know, a traditional knife should have bolsters and bone or stag or wood, and that's it. Like, if you're a traditional knife maker, that's what you make. You make what Tony Bowes will feel good that you made. But I, I wanted to bring something else, and it just evolved from there. And I still bring that in. I mean, probably one of the biggest influences on my career uh, is also Tony Bowes. So that traditional aspect of things is important to me. But I think about it this way. Uh, the knife makers at the turn of the 20th century were making knives using certain materials because that's what they had the best toughest thing they had was stag or bone or some durable woods today we've got other things we've got carbon fiber we have titanium i, I use titanium we have you know all these different amazing materials and amazing steels why not use that and so that's kind of what i did it's it's like the argument that if Rembrandt were alive today, he'd be using digital cameras and everything yeah. as modern as possible to express himself. You know, back then he had to use oil paints or tempera or whatever they were using back then. I think it was yeah. oil paint, but um, it's the same thing. And and actually, it's surprising to me uh, that it would be a reaction to the materials. How do the uh, old fashioned? I shouldn't say that. How do the traditional knife uh, or slip joint traditionalists? see your 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 uh, unorthodox blade shapes and your and your frames i mean they're you're 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 taking something you're calling it a um a barlow or not a barlow you're calling it a trapper but it doesn't look like a trapper it doesn't look like a trapper i've seen before you know you've got these yeah. crazy frames how do they react to the the different shapes they're seeing from your work um there are mixed reactions i i know you know there are a few of the hardcore traditionalists that just uh, it's not for them and that's okay. I, I, you know, there are different styles for everyone and I don't expect everyone to love my work or my designs. Um, but I hope that they can appreciate them for what they are. You know, I'm trying to think outside of the box as much as I can. Um, and just blend that line, you know, I'll, I'll go to very tactical knife shows and win an award with a very, in reality, a very traditional knife. And, and I, I'm, I'm trying to blend that, you know, join the, the best of both worlds of those two sides of the knife collecting spectrum to create, you know, in a way, a new genre. And, and when I started doing it, you know, I would do materials and I'd have multiple liners, you know, in bright colors. And at first people didn't like it. Now, when you see slip joints, a lot of guys do it. I mean, it's kind of the norm now. That was your Andy Roy influence there, right? His, yeah. his incredibly colorful and complex handles with so many pins and, and oh, his, his, things are, his things are beautiful. And actually his knives are beautiful. And it, it doesn't surprise me actually to hear that there's some, some uh, inspiration there just because when you look at the handles in particular on a lot of your knives, they do an, embody that sort of boldness of of color yeah. so what what mentors did you have any mentors uh who actually showed you the ropes and and how to grind and all that 
So I had one mentor here in Utah uh, that lived in my neighborhood as a kid. Uh, his name's Dave Lang. And he is kind of more of a loveless style knife and push dagger kind of guy, really old school art knife type of knife maker. And so I knew he did that as a kid. And it all started for me when the recession hit. I was a home builder, I was a general contractor and everything went south. And all of a sudden I had a whole bunch of time on my hands. And so I went and asked him, he was my first kind of influence. I really went to his shop a few times. I made one knife um, with him. And after I did that, I realized this was the thing for me. And so I got materials and tools and started going. So uh, that first, are you talking about your very first knife, like a, a fixed blade? Okay. Yeah, it was kind of a bushcraft style fixed blade. Yeah. So how do you make the jump into something like a slip joint, which is a complex build uh, by comparison? Yeah, it's very complex. Um, you know, I was very interested in it and I was collecting slip joints, more production like GEC or, uh, you know, I, I started in some customs. I had some from Brett Dowell. Mm -hmm. um, I think I had some from, I'm trying to remember who else, I think Rick Menefee, a few other guys. And I realized, you know what? it can't be that hard. I want to give it a try. And, and honestly, I, I lit Brett Dowell up and he was very accommodating and friendly and kind and patient with me. And he helped me answer my questions. I didn't have anybody here. So I had blade forums and I had guys like Brett. I had, uh, you know, like Ken Erickson was a big uh, influence and help and mentor for me at the time. Um, I did reach out to Tony Bose and, uh, was shocked that someone of his caliber and legendary status would even talk to me and let alone actually know who I was. And so those guys were patient, answered my dumb as all dumb questions and just trial and error and working through it uh, got there. And it's just kind of evolved as I've worked and studied and asked questions and tried things and, and it's moved forward. So at this point, it's your own, um, it's, you know, how you make a slip joint is your own process. Like you've, you've sort of formed it on your own through yeah. you know, with input from others, but it's, it's become your own process. Yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, I'll discuss things that I'm good friends, like with Nick, we've talked a lot on the phone and he's had questions and I'm always happy to help. I, you know, I look at the patience of those veteran knife makers and, what they gave to me and opportunities they gave me, I'm I'm all about paying it forward. Anybody that asks me, how do you do this? How do you do that? I'm going to tell them about it. Um, so yeah, it's uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm open to help anyone. So you made your first slip joint in 2012, and then, but what was yeah. your what was your big entree onto the scene? What was your break, if you will? Um. I'd probably say things progressed from that point moving forward just because I had something very different. And so it caught people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anybody was really doing what I was doing with a slip joint or a pocket knife. Um, and so it caught people's attention. And I think that it was in 2016 or 17, I, I started going to blade show just, going to be there around 2013. I think it was 2017, um, I went to the gathering and, and that kind of opened a lot of things up. Um, I went there as a new knife maker. I, I met the criteria for applying for the, the best new knife maker. The criteria was making knives for five years or less. And I was barely hitting that. And so I managed to win best knife maker that year and best of show at the same time. Nice. And so it, it opened a lot of doors and it, it made people pay a little more attention. So then I was able to venture out and try new things and, you know, things have just grown from there. And then getting involved with Benchmade has been a really big thing because obviously there's a much broader audience there. Yeah. So that's kind of where it's evolved to, but that's probably the, one of the bigger break, you know, breaks that they had when we sat together. The gathering. Now, the gathering, for uh, those who don't know, that's the um, 
usual suspects network um, annual meeting, usually in yeah. Las Vegas, I think it was. Yeah, it's in Vegas. And and it, it it's always struck me as a, I was a member of USM for a short period a long time ago, and it always uh, struck me as kind of the insiders um, insiders place to be as a as a yeah. knife person. I, it, it seemed like that was where the people that where all the mavens go, <clears throat> all the people who know the new stuff first uh, go there. So, yeah. that's, so I mean, we've been talking about your knives, and I know you have some in front of you. Show me uh, show me what what we're talking about here so okay. from, yeah from some traditional knives with crazy frames and blades so i'll i'll show you this one this one i don't think that i won the first award with this pattern but it was maybe the second second time of the gathering that i won an award but this one right here is my native pattern so this one's a, a tail lock so if you kind of think Along the lines of Ron Lake, I don't know how he builds them. I just took a lock back and added the tail portion. But, you know, the tail disengages the blade wow. and closes it. So this pattern was my first. You know, I had a guy say, hey, I want you to make this knife with, I want you to make a knife with kind of like this kind of blade and maybe a handle that's comfortable. So I made it. And I didn't think much of it. But uh, it it just kind of sat on the shelf for a little while. And then somebody else asked about it. I'm like, okay, I'll make it. And now I'd say this is probably right next to the Tango is probably my next. They're probably both my most popular patterns right now. So uh, I love that back lock or the uh, tail lock. Is that what you call it? Yeah, the tail lock. Yeah. Hold that, hold that back up uh, so I can see that, please. Yeah. So if you see, it's kind of, if you press it it's it's the same mechanism as a lockback so when you press it i try and make it so that they do this and yeah, just yeah. fall free um well that is something you don't see on many uh um traditional folders that free swinging uh guillotine yeah. style action there. yeah and it's a hard thing to do i mean i'm not gonna lie this you know this has a, a pin so about the size of these pins is right here at the pivot and as you can see, you know, it's it's all hidden. That's part of the, the draw chain. I mean, a lot of traditional construction, but in all reality, sort of a modern frame. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's important to have a tight spring and liner and everything else, and everything's flush and open and closed. Um, this shield is also a proprietary design of mine uh, that I came up with that has been really popular as well. Yeah, that's a good-looking shield. Is that uh, the shield that goes straight across? The, you have a different shield on the Tengu, right? You have different shields in general. Yeah, I have different shields. The one on the Tengu that's done by Benchmade um, is kind of a really traditional Spartan-style shield. Um, okay. Nothing super proprietary about it. They even The one I sent to them, they just kind of did their take on it, so it's kind of their take on my take on the same thing. So, right. Yeah. So what is what what kind of criteria do you hold yourself to or what what uh, you know for a good knife? What are you willing to let go out of the shop is what I mean? Um, I'm very picky. My wife would say I have OCD. And so <laughs> I I'm particular about it. I, you know, a lot of things matter. And I'll be honest with you. There are people that will get a knife and they'll say, hey, you know, everything's awesome. I noticed this. And it'll draw my attention to that. And I try and note that from that point forward. Um, that's how I started out. When I started making slip joints, I'd have guys do simple things like, hey, there's a sharp edge right here. You need to make that go away. You know, fix that on the next ones. And I, I, I take all that in. I don't, you know, I'm still learning, progressing, evolving, developing all my techniques and everything and trying to get better all the time. So I do what I feel at the time is the best that I can do. And and it sounds like a collector talking, you know. Uh, collector knife makers seem to have uh, really uh, very little room for mistakes, very little room for anything that they would wouldn't feel good spending a lot of money on themselves. Because let's face it, as I mentioned a lot, these are luxury items, and they're special, and they're things you want to buy because they're handmade, and you love the design, and they're unique. But you know, obviously. You don't need it. So if you're going to spend that kind of money on on a on a beautiful luxury item like a like an Oser knife, you want it to be just so. Yeah. And as a collector of knives yourself for your whole life, I, it seems like you recognize that. 
Yeah, I do. And I, you know, guys will, will message me and say, Hey, do you have any seconds, you know, any, any <laughs> no flawed sense. knives that, you know, are sitting in a drawer that you can send me. And I just say, no, if I mess up, it goes in the garbage. You know, it may not be the whole knife. Maybe I mess up the handle. I toss it. And I'll start it, over. There's some, uh, there's some trash collector in Lehigh, Utah. That is totally <laughs> psyched. He's like, check out my collection of Oster knives. Right. Like I said, it's not the whole knife. It's not like a finished knife. I won't, <laughs> I won't keep going with the knife. If I mess a part of it up, it's that part is out, but I'll keep moving with the knife until it's done and it's done right. I won't, I don't let it go unless I feel like it's done right. Right, right. So um, you, you mentioned you were a builder, a home builder. Um, yeah. And, and then you were sort of forced into, um, forced into taking up more time with knife making because of how the bottom fell out and, you know, in the mid you know, 2000s, uh, 2010s, whatever. Um, but how did it, I, I'm looking at this beautiful studio, this beautiful workshop behind you. You look like you have a fully built out operation at this point. How did that part of your um, knife making evolve, the the business part? You know, I mean, honestly, without getting too religious about it, it was something that was meant to be. It, it, progressed i by by about 2015 16 i had started jay or or knives as a company um so i'm filing taxes with that and with my building company and as things moved forward all of a sudden i'm paying more taxes with the knife business than with the home building business which was very strange and my wife came to me and said you know why don't you just pick one and do it and let's let's make this happen and at the time you know, I didn't have a shop. I was working in a shed and mm -hmm. on the side of my house. And so I said, well, if I'm going to do this, it needs to be done right. You know, I had the, the resources and the opportunity and the ability to build a house in it with a shop. And so we did that in nice. 2000, what was it? 2018, we moved into this house and had the shop and everything ready to go. And, it, and it's continued to evolve. I, you know, I, when I moved here, I didn't have access to a CNC and, and now I use it daily. And, and, you know, I have a good friend, uh, um, that helped me get started in that, uh, Darren Thomas, he, he actually brought his machine into my shop and showed me how to use it. And so I give him a lot of credit for helping me through that. I had, he had a lot of patience with me. A lot of people have had a lot of patience with me. <laughs> Believe me, I, I don't, uh, leave it unrecognized. I, I, I give credit where credit is due, but yeah, it just, it, it just evolved. And, and I have no other way to say than it was kind of the type of thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's all good. We, <laughs> it, it, um, <laughs> yeah. My kids are good at photobombing. <laughs> I'll make an announcement. Hey kids, I'm doing a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to my shop. Leave me alone. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> So actually, Jim, can you go to the top of, of this page? Uh, for those of you listening, we're looking at uh, Jay. I've been saying Oser. It's Ozer. Jay Ozer yes. um, uh, knives on Instagram. And, you know, it's just beautiful knife after beautiful knife. But at the very top, like the latest knives, latest two pictures you've posted have been especially uh, fascinating uh, knives to me. And I, I think they're the same knife. It's the same picture. This one right here. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Tell me about this thing. So that knife is one of those that the traditional guys don't particularly like. <laughs> this knife came about um, because I had a lot of people uh, using my designs. And it, it, it's kind of a, a weird thing. In, in the tactical knife world, you don't touch anybody else's design. It's theirs. You come up with your own. Mm -hmm. In the traditional knife world, for example, Tony Bowes, you know, in my eyes, probably the greatest traditional knife maker that's lived to date. Mm -hmm. He handed them out. I mean, he'd send me emails with all the patterns, like here's the pattern, here are all the parts, and exactly how you need to make it. Um, so I had a lot of people that were kind of from that traditional end. And rather than ask me, they'd just take a picture off of Instagram or whatever and make their own uh, and, and maybe tweak it a little bit and say, oh, this is my new pattern. I, you know, and then people would be like, oh, it looks a lot like Jared's knife, but, and some of them were exactly the same or, you know, as much as they could make it exactly the same as mine. So this knife, uh, it's called the Quaddle. 
I got the name from like Quetzalcoatl, oh, okay. right? the Mayan god Drag. or whatever. Uh, and it was my way outside the box. Go ahead and copy this and try and say it's your own design. Type of that. <laughs> That's all that was. And, it, it, you know, it, it wasn't super well received at first. And it has gained appreciation over time, which I think happens with most designs. Oh, I mean, uh, something. Uh, okay. I mean, it's a face uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, only a mother could love. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I don't mean that. I, I, it's so unusual for a traditional style um, knife, and with that gorgeous stag, I, I just love the 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 mashup of styles and and materials on this one. And and I just keep coming back. Do you have happen to have that in your um, in your general vicinity, or is that? Uh, I, I don't. I wish I did. On I the way to its new I, owner. I don't. Yeah, it's already on its way to its new owner. Yeah, yeah. I, but that yeah. one was one. I mean, that's one of the things I like to do. I will, I'll take one that is an absolutely modern design and use all traditional uh, materials and techniques to build it. It's interesting. I mean, you're talking about the the attitude in the tactical folder world versus the attitude in the uh, traditional or slip joint folder world being so different in that um, since since patterns were shared across different makers and companies for years with these traditional knives, it's just assumed that if a custom knife maker creates something within that realm, how convenient I can just bite off of that style. And, you know, in other words, be, it, it, it should be open source because it's a traditional knife. But if it's a modern yeah. knife, don't touch it. It's a weird thing. But it I can really see how it can thing. evolve in a certain community to, to be the standard. Yeah, it's a really strange thing. And I, I've tried to take from both. Uh, for example, my native slip joint pattern, I, I have, uh, you know, a photocopy of that, that I email the people, a bunch of people make it with my blessing. And, you know, I love seeing people's different take on it. Because when different hands touch it and build it, it'll never be the same as mine. It's their take on it. And it's always slightly different. So I, lo I love to see it. It's really cool. But I've had people say, well, can I have some other patterns? And that's the point where I say, well, no, I'm, the rest of them are kind of off limits and I'm taking more of the tactile knife approach on that. Yeah. This is my pattern and, and I'm going to be the only one that makes it. It's kind of like, do your own man, express yourself. Yeah. Don't express me. I'm doing it myself over here. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I can, I mean, I can appreciate both ends having dealt now with both ends. So I understand what they're trying to do, but, but I think, one of the best things I ever did, I made this decision, I think about three years ago now, I just decided I'm not going to make any more patterns that I got from Tony or from anyone else. I'm only going to make the ones that I've designed myself. And it's been, it's been good. It's pushed my creative abilities further, which has been really good. So speaking of design and uh, you, you're a graphic designer by training and, and a, a pencil, you know, a draftsman for your whole life. When you sit down to design a knife, is this? Uh, but I also am aware that you have CNC now, so I guess CAD has come yeah. has come into your life as well. Yes. Uh, has that changed how uh, what your design process is? My my design process is still pretty much the same. In fact, I've got here. I'm gonna, I'll give you a little peek of this one. This one may come up one day, but <laughs> all my notes. But I'll yeah. draw it by hand like that. Yeah, um, and then I'll scan it in do it on AutoCAD, it allows me to fine tune the mechanics and make sure that everything's functioning right. Um, I do it a little different way because from building, I'm used to the AutoCAD, like for drawing houses and floor plans and things. Oh yeah. So I'll go into that AutoCAD, draw it up in there, transfer it over to my CAD CAM project uh, um, uh, program, and then finish it off in that so that I can then see and see it. So the heavy lifting you do in the program, you're kind of used to from, from your house. Yes. Days. Yeah. 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 So do people do, okay. We're, we're talking about this traditional community. So do people bristle yeah. at that? Yeah, they, they do. They do. And it's, uh, I've, you know, I would say, uh, the, uh, for example, the group I have on Facebook, is, it's a great group, very good people. And I think that they get it. And what I explained to them when I first started using it is, look, it's just another tool in the toolbox. I'm not 
you know, pulling a handle and a blade off of the machine and it's done and I'm just screwing it together. I'm just bypassing the bandsaw and the, and the drill press for a minute. And it's given me opportunities of things that I can't do as accurately or maybe not even at all just by hand with hand tools. So it's just another tool in the tool shed. That's all I see it as. Well, it's like having an assistant in your shop that you don't have to give a lunch break in a way. Cause, exactly. Because yeah. if, if it's if it's just, you know, doing kind of some of the grunt work. Hey, Jim, stop right there at this stockman. I, I know you're not uh, you're not doing these kind of things anymore, but but yeah. but this is a very traditional. But this is one of the patterns that you're not going to do anymore. It's someone else's yeah. pattern, you know. Yeah. Um, but look at your take of it, uh, your take on it. Uh, you know, traditional stockman has a has the clip point and and the uh, and the uh, uh, what do you call it sheep's foot there, but you put on the other end this cool little recurve you know nasty little scalpel blade a cool take on the classic stockman which is one of my favorite patterns yeah and i will give i mean all the credit for that knife goes to tony bones that's his he calls it a, a diamond edge cattle knife and he does that cool little recurve clip. oh really yeah he did he did do that and uh his main blade clip was maybe a little different but that's a pattern uh that i got from him yeah, that's one of my favorites. And I have, I do have a three bladed stock knife or cattle knife that I do. The unique thing about that one is all the, the nail nicks are on one side and you can access them all. Oh. So they can all, all open first. You don't have to open one to open the other. And they're all on the front side and you can access them all. So I designed my own take on something like that. Um, and yeah, based on that knife. So the the stockman itself, uh, I don't know. Do you make any three bladed knives anymore? I do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you go on my homepage, I don't know if Jim's able to pull that up, but the, the top photo, it's a black yeah. knife. It's a three bladed yeah. stock knife. That's my pattern. I call it vaquero. Oof. Yeah, that one right there. So you can see it's the same idea. All three nail nicks are accessible on one side, um, but that one has. Uh, you know some different blade styles and and things that are a little bit out of the traditional and then you can see the shape of the handle too is just a little different god it's gorgeous it looks like the main blade is a kind of a worn cliff and then the one opposite of it looks like one of your tantos with that little swedge on top and this is my guess here and then and then it looks like you got a spade blade or something um i really love the look of that knife i mean that handle the chamfering around uh the whole perimeter of it it's got it's got a sort of a severe look, but a comforting look at the same time. You know, there's yeah. something about seeing those blades nestled together. Now, when you make a knife like that, or that knife in particular, are you are you um, angling the blades in in such a way so that they fit on two springs as opposed to three? Yes. Uh, so the two smaller blades, the the one that's folded behind the other one is crinked. That's the term for it. So basically, it's bent you have to bend it before you heat treat it. Um, and it has to be bent just the right amount so that when you actually grind it, that blade will slide right down in between the other two and fit like a glove. If you look at that knife from above, it's a super tight fit. Everything's fitting in there tightly, but nothing rubs. See, that's amazing to me. And that's, uh, you were alluding to this before with a stockman knife, you usually have to open up the sheep's foot before you open up the yeah. spade blade, if you don't want them to scratch and to, to yeah. rub against each other. And to yeah. have it so precisely um, engineered. And in a way, that's something that uh, you really want hands on, like a machine is going to have a hard time. Yeah. Oh, with yeah. That. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so you have that, which is kind of a your take on a very traditional pattern. Do you have any others that are, um, well, you do a uh, you do a um, a trapper, you do a single bladed trapper and a double bladed trapper, right? I do, yeah, yeah, yes, that's the one. There, the, yeah, wow. Yeah, so that one's kind of my modern take on an old style Warncliffe trapper. Another one of Tony Bose's patterns, one that he made very popular. Yeah, that one in this photo here that's closest to us, the black one, whew, man. I mean, all of them. I'm not, yeah. <laughs> they're all pretty sweet, but you know, I, I, I can't help but look and 
and imagine what I might add to my my own collection here. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do a lot of them. I'll base on uh, on an old pattern and just say, okay, this layout, basically blade layout. How can I make it a little more current or a little more different? So, what's your favorite part of the process? You know, I like it all. I I love designing new knives. I'll usually try and put out at least a couple of new knives a year, if not more. Last year, I think that I had. I had six or seven new designs last year, um, and I, I really enjoy bringing something new out, taking it from a drawing on a piece of paper to something that functions. And then I also love just playing with color combos and material combos and texture combos and everything else. That's that's a really fun part of it for me. Uh, do you have any of those six or seven knives uh, in front of you? Any of... Uh, of the knives from uh, last year that you that you put out, um, I do not. I, well, yeah, show us, I, I show us some show us some of what you got in front of you. Okay, I've got. <laughs> I, I didn't have a ton of them. I do have another tail lock. Most of these are actually knives that are in because people are asking for a cleanup. Oh, okay, I, I never have them. Like as soon as I make them, most of the time I sell them, so they're gone. Um, but one of another one of my port more pocket ones is another tail lock actually. Uh, this one's my solitude tail lock, so a little different blade shape, kind of more of a mm -hmm. more like a trapper style sort of. It looks kind of like a Zulu blade there. Yeah, a little bit, kind of a mix of a Zulu and maybe a spear, just a little bit. But you know, another tail lock, mm -hmm. um, and I've got another. I have another native, which is a, a lock back. Wow. Can you hold so, that right up to your camera? Yeah. Let's see if I can get those colors. Old rag. It's kind of hard to get the, the full effect of the colors. You can see the materials in there. So that's, you said rag micarta? Yeah, rag micarta. Cool. So this is some old vintage stuff. So this one's a little different because, you know, it's obviously got the mid lock. Right. Versus the tail, but similar effect. So do more of your lock locking knives sell uh, or do you sell more of the uh, slip joints? Um, I try and do a mix. People really like the locking knives and they particularly like the tail locks. I just happen to have you know, a bunch of those here today. Right, right. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and I'll do, I'll try and do a mix. I've been doing a lot of traditional knives this month. I'm going to start doing some more, you know, liner lock flippers and things like that again and i try and mix it up a little bit um then the knife you held up the design that you held up i couldn't help but notice uh looked different it looked like a flipper um like a more traditional modern flipper if you if you get my drift is that uh an area that you're thinking of moving into or as you, far as like doing uh modern flippers yeah exactly yeah. It, oh yeah yeah uh, i do a bunch of those in fact uh, I think most of the designs I did last year uh, are modern flippers. Um, and, and they're on the website. I've, uh, I did the Hawk Flipper, which is one that I, probably the most recent one that I did last year. And then I have a Micro Tangu and a Micro Native. So yeah, here's here's the Hawk Flipper. Oh, right, of course. Yes, yes. And so it's, uh, Look at that, that was just a, a standard flipper. Yeah, this, this was a piece of steel provided for me by a friend of mine. He said, give it a try. And man, it turned out really cool. I yeah, that's it. gorgeous. But yeah, the Hawk Flipper, it's, it's been a really good one. It's, uh, you know, it's still in that same vein. It's, it's a flipper, but it's kind of got a more gentleman feel to it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say, I, and I love that. Uh, I love the sort of neutral aspect to the handle and to the blade. And yet, you know, like that blade looks like it's built for utility. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, tr the key thing that I try and do with everything that I design is I try to do something very clean with subtle lines that, that have a certain feel. And unless I can get that put together right, I just don't build the knife. So what was it like, or what is it like working with a giant company like Benchmade? You know, it's been great. And as big of a company as they are, they're a very personal company. 
And, and I'll be honest, when I started on this, I can't tell you how many knife makers came to me and said, don't, don't work with knife bench made. Oh. It's, it's, it's not going to be good. I heard this from this knife maker and this from that knife maker. And, and they've actually been really great. They've been uh, very personal. You know, I talked to the owner. I'll talk to, you know, one or two people most of the time. I know them well and they're easy to get hold of. I can text them right now and they'll answer. And, right. and they're, they're great to work with. And, uh, you know, we work together on these designs and, and with the Tangu, we went through a whole bunch of different R and D versions until we got to the right thing. And I'd ask for specific things and they'd accommodate and it was great. They, I mean, I, I remember when that came out we did a, a little piece on it here on the show. And I remember, um, just noting that in a year where most of the releases, um, you know, have a very utilitarian tactical black, uh, look that the Tengu was just, man, it was just a, a breath of fresh air, if you will. It was totally, totally yeah. out of left field for, for Benchmade, which, uh, you know, I, 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 they are a great maker of, of knives as tools uh, for, you know, lots of different uses. They're just, yeah. you know, they, they don't get me that excited that often. And when I saw them take, take on the Tengu and, you know, I just thought they're going to go crazy. They're going to go gangbusters with this because people want something a little bit different, but yeah. they know that they can trust the quality and that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And it, that's what it's been. It's been, uh, you know, it's been featured in, in magazines and it's been, it's been very well received, which is exciting for me, but it's always, you know, I went to shot show last year, um, to do the unveiling of that knife and you look in their case and you see a lot of knives, like you said, that are very similar and that one stands out and that's, that's what I want. I mean, that's what I try and do with my knives. I want that knife that stands out. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's actually in that, in that cabinet, it's like, the guy in the tuxedo when everyone else around is like in their camo, you know, like, yeah, yeah exactly. So a uh, customer service, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm guessing because you have uh, a couple of knives in to clean up and you haven't said, Hey, clean up your own knife. You know, I got work to yeah. do here. Um, of course, you know, uh, custom knife makers. I, I think it must be a pleasure actually to get a knife back, see how it's been used, see how it's taken on mileage and stuff like that. Um, but how does customer service uh, fit into the uh, J. Ozer knife um, uh, canon? I, you know, I view it the same way that I felt like I wanted it as a collector when I had a knife, even if it was because I, you know, rubbed it with a cloth that had something on it and scratched the blade. I wanted to be able to send it in and have it taken care of. And so I'll do that. And, you know, some guys will take advantage of it. They're just getting it cleaned up so that they can sell it easier. But a lot of guys are getting it cleaned up because they put their knife in their pocket and they just want it to get refreshed so that it feels new again. And so, I, I you know, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I, I do charge a little bit, but it's not very much um, because it does take some time. Sure. But, you know, I enjoy, I love seeing people use my knives. I know that a whole bunch of them are sitting in a safe somewhere mm -hmm. and get taken out and polished every once in a while and dusted off. But I love it when I get a knife back that I can tell someone has been cutting stuff with it. So I'm, I'm always happy to clean them up. And I, you know, I know some knife makers have just finally said, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not going to do a spa treatment, but you know, I'll, I'll keep doing it. I'm not going to stop. That, uh, that sort of used look, um, or the vibe that you get from a knife that's gotten a lot of use. Uh, I have a, a big enough collection that on some knives, I've tried to accelerate it a little bit. Oh, I'll throw it in my, in my pocket with some change or, or yeah. something like that. And every time I do something like that, I think, you know, maybe if you had just fewer knives and you actually use the ones you have, like, or, um, or, you know, maybe if you, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but the, but the, uh, the thought of, of the, of the mileage on a knife, is is part yeah. of what makes it special and part of what yeah. makes you want to keep it yeah. and um i have a few custom knives um uh, i have four i think at this point uh fully custom knives and um i'm a little squeamish about uh about yeah. you know jacking them up but i could see something like having a, a custom slip joint ending up in my pocket all the time in a little yeah. in a little leather sheath and just yeah know. well I, it's a funny story about that uh, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I reference Tony Boys a lot 
because you know he was a he was I truly admire him and he was a great man and and I considered him a friend and and uh, he used to mock people that had a leather slip that they put their knife in their pocket in. I mean he he made fun of me so bad for that because I I mean I sell mine with them right like all of my knives come with one of these. Oh nice. Because I know there are guys that want to do that and I and I do too. I'm. You know, like I said, I'm a little bit of OCD perfectionist kind of guy. And so I want it to stay nice as long as I can. Well, I, I mean, I can clean it up now, so it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, yeah. He was the guy. He's like, you throw it in your pocket. And it doesn't matter what's in there. Just who cares? And and he just, he hated the pocket slip thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the two being too precious. But the one thing about the pocket slip is that, for me, it always keeps the knife oriented in the yeah. in the proper. I hate it when they ride horizontally. Yeah. In the pocket, oh, I'm you know? with you. I'm so, not saying that I totally agree with Tony's opinion. But yeah, yeah. Saying, yeah. Hard man to disagree with, though. It is. Yeah, he is. So what is your collection, um, you know, kind of come in full circle? Uh, I've spoken to a lot of knife makers who, when they take the take the dive into knife making as a life and as a career, their um, collection kind of, uh, scatters to the four winds either they have yeah. to trade some of it in or whatever or, or maybe some of the knives they were collecting don't don't hold the same fascination anymore now that they're making knives i'm not sure exactly what it is yeah. but what has become of your collection a little bit of that a little bit of both uh it lost a little bit of fascination because a lot of them i feel like i can make a knife just as good as or better and so why bother having one that i paid more for but in, uh, for the majority of the knives that I had before, I sold most of those so that I could fund the tools so I could make my own. So it just it served a purpose and it was great and I enjoyed it. And and those knives are still inspirational. But you know, I have a few. I, I have a couple of knives like from Andy, um, just because he is a good friend and I I think he does a great job. Um, and I really don't have any others other than my own. Hmm. That's, it. that's pretty uh that's pretty cool uh, i mean you know any knife you want to make you basically make it yourself at this point yeah yeah <laughs> i really can I, I i can make whatever i feel like i need at the time so yeah so how does the operation grow how does j ozer knives grow um that is the challenge because i am limited by myself <laughs> and i can only make so many knives um i think that the way I'm working on some projects, you know, obviously a lot of things going with Benchmade, mm -hmm. some projects on other things with other people that uh, Benchmade doesn't want to tackle. Um, but other than that, it's just try and do, you know, push my limits as much as I can. That doesn't necessarily mean make more knives, but it just means do more innovation, do more intricate processes up my game constantly so that's that's the evolution that i see so you mentioned uh, a couple of uh projects that benchmade might not want to take on um without going into details which uh, i'm sure you would if you could uh but what you know what kind of are you talking about certain innovations or or yeah certain things um you know, there uh, I'm I'm looking at doing my own kind of mid tech thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, I have an agreement with Benchmade where I kind of have a non compete. I don't I can't go into anywhere else unless it's something in that range. So you know, I have the ability to do my own mid techs. I've talked to some people that want to work on maybe some pry tools or beads or you know go together on something like that, and so. Things along those lines are moving forward as well. Oh, that's that's great. I mean, you have all of the tools at your disposal. There there are a lot of ancillary products to the knife industry that yes, yeah, that suckers like me just <laughs> buy up, man. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. Like uh, you know, uh, my desire for tools. <laughs> It, that sounded weird, but my 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 love of collecting <laughs> knives, you know, and and uh, all of that is is much more is much stronger than my actual need for them, you know. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. Every, every day I select several knives that I'm going to carry on that day, and uh, 
when the random cutting task does come up, which is, you know, rare. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. have to make that decision. Okay. All right. Which one's it going to be? That's right. So, uh, you know, as part of me really just uh, uh, wishes that I could just have one knife and, and have it be a sweet knife, like maybe one of the ones you made and have that carry me through life. And then I hand that one knife over to one of my, or maybe two or three and I hand them over to my kids and, and then that's it. But that's, you know, yeah, no, that's not reality. <laughs> that is that is indeed not reality. So let me ask you one more question here. Would you take on a uh, a shop, uh, uh, someone else in the shop to help you build these? Is this uh, is this something that would interest you, or is your uh, artist life and the way you came up as an artist and and that can be a very solitary activity, drawing and painting and that kind of thing. Uh, do you intend to keep this just kind of a solitary activity? I do, and but it's probably not necessarily uh, from a standpoint of solitarity, of, of solitude, mm -hmm. but more a sense of I'm too picky. <laughs> and, and I I don't know that I, I'm trying to, it wouldn't be the word trust, not that I don't trust someone else to do it, but. I'd probably spend more time over their shoulder, making sure they did what they're doing right. And it would just take me more time if I just did it myself. I mean, that's kind of a, I don't know, a jerk thing to do, but or to say, but that's kind of how I am. I'm just, I'm, I'm really particular and picky about how things are done. And the few things that are monotonous that I don't want to do get taken care of by the CNC. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm kind of covered. The other things are things that I feel like I need to have my hands on. Um, you know, I know that other knife makers don't feel that way, but that's just kind of how I feel. And that may change. I don't know, but that's how I am. That's how I feel right now. But I, I want my hands on it and my hands only. Yeah. Your name is going on it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Your hands and your hands only. Well, uh, Jared, I appreciate your coming on the knife junkie podcast to tell us about this stuff. Uh, I think, I think what you're doing is really uh, interesting and compelling, but I mean, besides all of that, those kind of words, I just, I just think your knives are beautiful and, um, Thank you. I, I, you're welcome. And, um, with, you know, I say this, I say this cautiously, I, I would love to see more custom knife makers out there doing what you're doing, um, and giving the people who like to collect slip joints, but also have interest in handmade knives, uh, you know, kind of more options. And maybe they're out there, but I feel like there are way more people doing the tactical thing. Yeah, I, I think that's true, but there are more coming. Um, you know, I have a few friends that are, that have plans and intentions to enter this world. And, and you know, I've been able to help, I, you know, I guess, inspire them to do it. And, I, and I'm happy that that's the case. And, uh, you know, as long as I'm here, I won't let it go. I, there was a time when I sat at Blade Show with Tony before he passed, and and he said, you know, when I'm gone, I need you to you, you need to keep this going. You need to keep slip joints alive, and I took that to heart. And so they, as long as I'm around, they're going to be around, and I'm going to push it and uh, hopefully inspire other guys to do the same. Right on. Thank you, Jared. Thanks, Paul. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Pleasure's mine. You too. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Wow, he got uh, he got his marching orders from Tony Bowes. That's, that's amazing. Uh, if you don't know who Tony Bowes is uh, while you've been listening to this, uh, you definitely owe it to yourself to uh, look him up and check out his knives and see what he uh, did for the slip joint world, the traditional knife world, uh, in, in the past, uh, you know, past 50 or so years. Um, uh, so yeah, keep it alive, Jared, he says, and that's a, that's a pretty amazing bit of info or, or advice to get passed along by someone like Tony Bowes. So before we wrap, I would just like to say, if you want to help support us here on the Knife Junkie podcast, consider checking out what you can get as a patron of the show on Patreon. There are three levels of support, and for your patronage, you get Knife Junkie stickers, a mention on the podcast, early access to the Sunday interview, and midweek supplemental podcast with no ads during the show. There'll be one up front. And at the top tier of support, you're automatically entered into a monthly knife giveaway. 
excuse me, there have been about, uh, there have been about five so far and they've all been spectacular knives. So you definitely want to get in on that. Your support helps fund the infrastructure of the show, getting uh, servers, hosting apps, equipment, and eventually uh, it will allow me to purchase new knives to show you it's for you. So check us out on, uh, on Patreon and find out what being a, a member of the knife junkie Patreon page uh, can do for you. So, uh, Without any more chit chat, I will tell you that it's been a real pleasure talking with Jared uh, Ozer of J Ozer Knives. And um, well, that's me for the week, and I will see you next week. And uh, well, definitely don't take Dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.